<clears throat> well, brothers and sisters, we've, we've kind of been doing an unintentional uh, series from the book of Hebrews focusing on Jesus as the great high priest. And we are continuing that. The reason I say unintentional is not because um, God is unintentional or this is accidental. God, uh, God, of course, has his plan and is very wise, and he figured these things out long before I did. Uh, but we are following along with the lectionary, which, um, as some of you may know and some of you may not know, the lectionary is something uh, that guides pastors and churches in following through um, all, all the parts of the Bible over the course of three years in a rotation that takes into account uh, the church calendar, things like Advent and Christmas and Lent and Easter, and then also provides time in between. And it just so happens that this year, at this time, we are going through the book of Hebrews. And so uh, that has been kind of really neat, I think. Today we are looking particularly at uh, we are looking particularly at Hebrews chapter nine, verses twenty-four to twenty-eight, and uh, we will be looking as well at the myth of Sisyphus. And don't worry if you don't remember or know what the myth of Sisyphus is. We'll fill in the details. If you took uh, if you took Greek mythology way back in the day, which I think most of you did at some point or another, then you may, in the dim recesses of your mind, remember uh, who Sisyphus was, but maybe not. No problem. We'll get it. Uh, all right. So our Bible reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. You can pull out the few Bibles that you have in front of you, or you can just listen Carefully, uh, if you'd like. I didn't put the actual scriptures up, but maybe, uh, yeah, Pete did. So you can also follow along on the screen as well. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Just to pause there for a second and remind ourselves that through this section of the book, the author of Hebrews is sort of setting up the parallel and also the contrast between Jesus as the great high priest and the human high priests who have come through the ages and helped the people of Israel with their sin and their uh, life of devotion to God. And so when, Jesus, when, when Christ, uh, the author says, did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, he's comparing Jesus ascending into heaven to the tabernacle and to the temple here on earth, which are, as it were, as significant and beautiful and wonderful as they may have been, they are really a pale imitation of the sanctuary that is, God's actual throne room in heaven itself. So, carrying on. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to, have, would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to what take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And by that, Hebrew, the author of Hebrews means not that you are not saved now, but rather that the culmination, the absolute total fulfillment of that salvation and all of its implications will come to be known by us when Christ comes again to claim 
his own. This was the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, we need to talk about the myth, if we can. Can you advance one slide for me, Pete? I lost control. I have no control. Um, so the myth of Sisyphus is the story of uh, a guy named, obviously, Sisyphus, who was supposedly the first king of the city that we would sort of know as Corinth. Um, it had a different name when he first founded it. It was Ephira, 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 I don't know, E-P-H-R or Y-R-A, however you might say that. But he was supposedly the founding, uh, the founding father and the first king of that city. And he was a sneaky, sneaky fellow. He was very clever. In fact, he was so clever that on two different occasions, he, uh, he snuck out of dying. So supposedly at one point, he snuck out of dying by, uh, by saying to his wife that, hey, when he dies, she should just throw his naked body into the town square for the, for the birds or whatever to get and, and just be very disrespectful and so on and so forth. And then when his spirit got to the underworld, he said, look how my wife treated my body. That's terrible. You should let me go back so that I can correct her for her badness. And so um, apparently, you know, the god of the underworld wasn't very bright, and he let him go back, and then he, uh, Sisyphus refused to return to the underworld once he had chastised his wife. And then later on, later on, he, uh, oh, let me see, what did he do? Oh, I can't remember the second one. But he, he, deceived, uh, he deceived people again and cheated death again. And so as punishment, Zeus sentenced him to push a boulder up a mountain over and over and over. You're remembering now, right? Yeah. So, right? Over, he would push it up to the top of the hill and it would roll back down. And he would push it up to the top of the hill and roll back down. Over and over and over for all eternity. A job with no purpose, no progress, no goal, no meaning to punish him for his sins. The very definition of a useless or insane task. It has been said before that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And here Sisyphus is stuck in that loop. But brothers and sisters, it's kind of, in a way, like the sacrificial system for Israel. See, when, when God institutes the animal sacrifice system, God is not doing so, we find out later on in the New Testament, God is not doing so thinking that actually these animal sacrifices that happen over and over again will actually make a difference. In fact, we hear that they made no difference whatsoever. But all the same, they're not quite trapped in the same kind of Sisyphean, if I can say that, loop that Sisyphus was. See, because there were at least two things that those animal, animal sacrifices did. Listen to what the Bible Project, and the Bible Project is an absolutely fantastic uh, project. You can find it at bibleproject.org. So cool and awesome, fantastic. Check it out. They say about the animal sacrifice system, they say, 
for the Israelites cutting an animal throat, animal's throat and watching its blood, that is, its life drain from its body, was a visceral symbol of the devastating results of their sin and selfishness. It was not something that was removed from them. It was not something that was foreign to them. See, we, we have the problem in, in a way that we don't, we don't practice animal sacrifice, and I'm not recommending that we go back to that or anything like this. But we talk about the theology of total depravity, for example, the fact that we are all born into and choose sin in our lives. But we don't see the devastating results of that sin quite as concretely as the people of Israel did. Here's a disturbing exercise for you. Close your eyes and imagine your favorite animal. Your dog, your favorite cow, your cat, whatever it is. And now put a knife in your imaginary hand. And I find it difficult to say this. Slice its throat. And see its blood spill out. That's terrible. That's horrible. This is not something that we want to imagine and certainly not something that we want to experience. And yet part of the reality of animal sacrifice among the people of Israel was the reminder that someone, something, needed to pay the debt that was owed. And at the same time, every life was valuable. The people of Israel were not supposed to take pleasure in the sacrificial system. They're not supposed to say, yes, blood and gore. <laughs> no. Not at all. And yet the life that those animals gave was supposed to remind them of their need and the terrible consequences. And so, in a way, one of the ways that the animal sacrifice system helped the people of Israel was as a deterrent. Right? If you see the consequences of your sin right in front of your face, with your hands holding the bloody knife, or the hands of the high priest doing it for you, it's hard to pretend to yourself that everything's okay. Right? And at the same time, not only was the blood of the animals supposed to serve as a deterrent, look, don't sin, because when you sin, this is what happens. But it was also serving as a detergent. Right? That only life can wash away death. And so the lifeblood of the animal is given to wash away the death of my sin. There was a fad a while ago, very bad fad. Do not try this at home or anywhere else. There was a fad of people purportedly trying to eat Tide Pods. You know, 
those things that you put in the washing machine to clean your clothes, right? I can sort of see it in that they look kind of candy-like-ish, sort of, whatever, but they're very deadly. They can kill you for sure. Absolutely. Don't do it. But that's not how you cleanse yourself. Nor is injecting bleach, nor is even vaccines, nor is anything else. None of those things will cleanse you or I. But there is something very true about the reality that there is some blood, one person's blood, that will cleanse us white as snow. Right? The problem with the sacrificial system of animals is that animals are not human. Animals are not people. The Bible makes it clear that ultimately, really, there, there's no animal whose sacrifice can cleanse you or I. I I'm not going to ask you to do this but you probably should. But I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine the person that you love the most in this world. I'm not going to ask you to put the knife in your hand. And I'm not going to ask you to imagine slicing your throat. But that's what Abraham almost had to do. That's what Abraham was being asked to do. And not only was that a test of faith for Abraham, but it was also a symbol of what was to come. That God, the Father, would do the same thing with his son Jesus, except instead of stopping and being able to sacrifice an animal instead, he had to go the whole way. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that though Jesus gave himself willingly, and though the Father sacrificed his Son willingly, it was you and I holding the knife. And if you imagine the person on this earth whom you love the most, and you realize that that person cannot possibly love you, no matter how much they love you, as much as Jesus loves you, and as you ought to love him, you ought to love him more than anyone or anything else on this earth, if you put Jesus in that place with your hand and your knife and his blood, his lifeblood flowing out to cleanse you and me from our sin. Then we have the ultimate deterrent and the ultimate detergent. See, this is part of our problem, I think. We persist in a couple of different errors. We persist in trying to pretend to ourselves that we're really not that bad. That we're really not that bad. I'm a good person. I try and do what is right. I try and do the good thing. And yet, there is Jesus' blood all over my hands. 
And at the same time, and often in almost the same breath, we, we proceed and persist in the opposite error, saying, I'm so terrible that God could not possibly love me. God could not possibly forgive me. And yet, instead of Jesus' blood on my hands being guilt, it is Jesus' blood on my hands washing me of all of those sins. How dare we say that Jesus' sacrifice given freely for us would not be enough? That God would not be willing to forgive us when he gave everything for us? It is terrible both to say, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm okay. And it is terrible to say, God couldn't possibly forgive me. I'm so horrible. Instead, we are left in humbled and awe-filled wonder that I killed Jesus who willingly gave his life for me so that I might be clean, washed by his blood, forgiven of everything I could ever possibly do and welcomed into his family. What terrible cost. awesome joy. Brothers and sisters, there's the old saying that goes, familiarity breeds contempt. I was doing some more genealogical research on my family and I have been able to discover that my family, at least some branches of my family, have been part of the Reformed Church for at least 400 years. Imagine. I have family members who lived in Normandy in France and who fought the religious wars against the Catholics as Calvinists, as Huguenots. There are people in my family back there who were probably actually taught by John Calvin himself. And so there's a lot of time for folks from my family to say, ah, yeah, yeah, we're Christian. Yeah, been Christian for 400 years. Right? But familiarity cannot breed contempt in me. Or you. If it does, then we lose so much. We lose the reality of what we have done to our Savior. And we lose the reality of how much Jesus loves us. And we lose the reality of how much sacrifice meant and does for us. Brothers and sisters, As much as I don't want to make you have that imagination to go through that exercise, it might be good to do. But what are some alternatives? What are some ways that we can help to remember and not take for granted our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I don't often recommend movies for you or anything like this. If you have not seen Mel Gibson's ver version of The Passion, if you've never seen it, then I might recommend you see it. It's not an easy film to watch. And it's a film I have seen once, and I will probably never want to watch again. But it is good especially if you remember the role you play and I play 
in that movie. There are, of course, other things you can do, things that are, are, are more, uh, more simple, more everyday things. Right? Remember, okay, remember the reality that if you love if you love your spouse, if you love your daughter, your granddaughter, your grandson, your whatever, and you never ever spend time with them, and you never ever talk to them, and you never even think about them, well then you don't really actually love them. It's the same with God, right? Spend time with God. Do your devotional reading. Spend time in His Word. You, you don't have to sit there and read the Bible and, and learn all the theology. Like I said when we were preparing for communion, you don't need to do a master's level test on every passage that you study or anything. Just spend time with God. And if you have questions, by all means, look it up. Talk to a friend. Talk to your pastor or whatever you want. But spend time with God. And, and not just spending time reading, but also reading with an attitude of listening, right? It, it's all about how you approach the text, right? If you're studying for a science exam as a student in high school, you approach the text to grab everything you can out of it so that you can do well on the test. No, don't do that with the scriptures. Instead, with the scriptures, allow the scriptures to read you. Read the scriptures with the attitude of, Lord, I am listening. What are you saying to me here? Not, what do I need to pass the catechism test? Mr. Spike has lots of terribly hard catechism tests, right? <laughs> right? But let the scriptures read you. And so along with your reading, along with a humble attitude that allows the scriptures to read you, Pray. Pray. You don't need to do fancy highfalutin prayers. Pray. Like Tevya in... Thank you. Fiddler on the roof. Oh Lord, why did you make me poor? I know it's no great shame to be poor. If I were a rich man, you know. Just talk to God. God doesn't require your fancy. Talk to God. Spend time with God. Read the scriptures. Remember the role that you played in his death and remember the role that he plays in your life. Brothers and sisters, this beast being Sisyphus. See, either if we don't do these things, either we're rolling the ball of our guilt up a mountain over and over and over again and pretending like Jesus' life doesn't make any difference. Woe is me, I'm terrible, I'm horrible, God couldn't possibly love me. Oh, there the boulder go down to the bottom again. Oh, i got to push it up. I'm such a failure. That echoes a lot with me. That's what I do to myself a lot. Or we're rolling the mountain of our delusion about how fine we are and how we're okay up the mountain over and over and over again. I'm an okay guy. I don't do bad things. Oh, I made my wife really upset. Oh, there's the boulder down at the ground. I better push it back up, do some more good things. Hopefully it'll weigh out. Let's not. Let's not be sisters. Brothers and sisters, let us remember the terrible sacrifice and the awesome gift. And may it make us new. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for sending your Son 
Thank you so very much that the animal sacrifice system is dead and gone. Not because it is terrible to kill animals in that way. It, it, it can be horrible. But because instead, you, Jesus, have stepped in and taken our place. You, Jesus, your blood is our detergent. Help us, O oh God, to see how your death at our hands in combination with the gift of your life that you give for us so that we may live, how that is not only the ultimate detergent, but also the ultimate deterrent. Lord, help us to walk closely with you. Lord, if we need to watch a movie, if we need to spend more time praying, if we need to spend more time with you, O oh God, in your scriptures, however it is, O oh God, if we need to imagine ourselves holding that knife and seeing and receiving that gift, whatever it is, O oh God, help us to hear you. And to draw always closer to you, our great high priest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.